Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Brian. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. This is the first time somebody's let me near a podium <laughs> since speech class in 1986. Um, and in fact, you know, I was nervous to do this. This is the first time I've ever spoken to like this. And it's the first time I've spoken to uh, this many people. And uh, 15 minutes is probably going to seem like a long time and a really short time all at the same time. Um, so... This is, you know, this is how it was. How it was was, um, I'm, I'm really like a lot of you. You know, I started drinking and using drugs um, when I was very young. And I loved it. And I became the person that was doing that more than all my friends, more than anybody I knew. I was... I was. I thought this is just the bee's knees, and and I want to do this as much as I can do it. And um, the very first time I drank, just you know, real quick, I got arrested. And that's that's like you know, I've heard that so many times. That's like not even unusual. I've heard that out of you guys. You know, you guys are all like that. You know, um, you know, but that's what happened. And then what started happening really quickly was I kept getting arrested, you know, a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot and, you know, ended up in solitary and because I just, Juvie wasn't enough, they needed to put me in solitary and, you know, I viewed all this like they're just trying to break me and, you know, you're not going to break me, you know. That's how I looked at it. That's, I mean, entirely how I looked at it. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. There's nothing wrong with, there's, everything is wrong with you and the way you're viewing me. And, you know, I'm really doing this well. Like, you definitely couldn't do this as well as me, you know. So this, this continued until I left my house when I was 17 years old. I was out of the house because, you know, they, they weren't into me doing what I was doing. So I went and found somewhere else to live. And uh, I stopped going to high school uh, because that was in the way of me doing what I wanted to do as well. And um, eventually I was homeless. And uh, this is really an unusual thing to happen for somebody from, you know, a town of, you know, 25,000 people where I came from. You know, I was really an outlier, you know, the way I was behaving. Um, and it, it got me into treatment because eventually I was homeless and I was like, you know, I want to go home. And, and my mom says, well, you can come home if you go to treatment. And I thought, fuck, yeah, I'll go to treatment. You know, 30 days, food, <laughs> you know, warm, all this great shit, you know, and then I get to go home. This is great, you know. And uh, I did that, but... What happened was I met some of you there, and that was something I didn't expect to happen. Some people came in, brought meetings, brought a message, and at first I was, I just thought you're all funny, you know. These people were funny, they were kind of cool, they were definitely happier than all the rest of us, you know, on this side. They were the happy people, and they were laughing, and they seemed like they really liked each other. And it was very attractive, honestly. And then they were talking about this spiritual way of life and this way of life that had to do with, you know, these spiritual principles. And this is why they were happy and relaxed. And, and this was very attractive to me. So I decided that even though I'm not an alcoholic, I'm going to do this thing. And I'm not going to tell them I'm not an alcoholic. I'm going to always tell them, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. And I'm going to do that thing because I want what they have. So I did that till I was 24 and a half. 
And I went to meetings thinking, I'm not really an alcoholic, but I really dig what these people got going on. And it worked for me. Until one day I thought, you know, I really have missed out on a lot. And um, maybe I can drink now. Maybe I, maybe I, I probably, in fact, I probably could drink even better than those other bozos that didn't do this six years of AA. So I asked my friend if I could borrow his car, went to a club, had three drinks, had three beers, danced, tried to get laid, didn't, got in the car on the way home, put the car around a palm tree. That was my first drink in six and a half years. That's how it went. And so, you know, every time I tried to drink after that, and I didn't try a lot because it scared me. You know, I was damn scared of that. But every time I did, something really bad happened. So I came to an obvious conclusion, and that is I suck at this. I suck at drinking. I don't know how these people drink. I don't know how they do it. I can't drink like them. I just I can't seem to do it. So I should just not do that, and I should do other drugs. Because, <laughs> you know, the idea of not doing anything, that did not. That wasn't something I was going to do. So that's what I did for a long time. And then I moved to Australia. And then in Australia, um, I wasn't drinking, you know, for the first you know few months. And I, I was given a visa, and I had a great job, and... Everybody told me, if you, do, you don't drink, if you don't drink here, you're not going to have any friends. And I thought, yeah, but you don't know me. I'm, I'm a really likable guy. <laughs> 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 that's true for you, but that's not true for me. And, and they, were, they were like, no, for real. Yeah, even you, even you are not going to have any real friends if you don't drink. And you can't just drink. You have to get drunk with these people. This is the culture that is here. And I didn't believe them until, you know, I think about five months, and I was like, I don't have any friends. So I need to go get friends. And so um, I chose a pub, and I decided what I was going to do was learn how to drink like everybody else. That's what I was going to do. Again, I don't, it's, how do I not know at this point that I'm an alcoholic? It's astonishing to me, after being in these rooms for all those years, my, and this is what's really amazing to me, and this is something to get, the power of my illness to delude me into thinking that I don't have it is astonishing. What? Evidence could come up in my life, such powerful evidence that I'm an alcoholic. And my brain can take that evidence and come up with, I am obviously not an alcoholic. <laughs> it's incredible to me now. The power of delusion. You know, the second step talks about insanity and the, and the power to restore us to, in, to sanity. You know, and I'm thoroughly, I'm really convinced in order to get there, one needs to understand they're insane. I needed to understand I was insane. And that's the insanity that was going on. Not the insanity of I thought, you know, lollipops were giraffes. Not that kind of insane. The insanity of all the evidence in my life that I'm an alcoholic and me not being able to grasp that fact that was right in front of me. So I tried to, I tried to learn how to drink, and what, what happened was I, I made a lot of friends, made great friends, and I got drunk every night because that's what everybody did. I also learned another little fact about myself. My friends will be the people, just like all of us, anybody in the world, everybody. Our friends are people that live like we do. That's why they're our friends. You know, so... The people that I was friends with all my life were people that drank like I drank and used like I used. And I thought that was just the norm. I thought that's how everybody drank and how everybody went through life because that's all I saw. I surrounded myself with those kind of people. So in the end, you know, I came here, I got married, I got a business, you know, and I only got five more minutes to tell you about what happened. I got sober, okay? 
It's incredible what happened. It's truly a miracle. It didn't have hardly anything to do with me whatsoever. I have no idea how you all got sober. None. Because I could not have gotten sober. And I am totally not even exaggerating. I could not get sober. I could not stop drinking. I could not stop. I was, in, I was coming to these rooms for another four or five months every day and going home and drinking every day. I could not stop. A lot of you remember that. There's a lot of you that remember me coming to AA. Fucking wreck. Total wreck. But I kept coming, and I kept coming, and I kept coming. It was because I was listening to you guys, and I believe that if it could happen for you, it could happen for me. You know, And my life was on the line. It was, it was, it was as deadly serious as I'm going to die. I'm, it's not, I'm going to lose. I've lost everything. So the loss and losing part's over. So I'm going to die. So I must either get sober or I'm going to die. Or, you know, and that's probably true for a lot of you. It probably is true for a lot of you. And what I can tell to you about, you know, the last 26 months or not 26 months, 38 months. So three years and two months. It's all it's been. Um, is that I mostly, I mean, I've hardly done anything on my own. You know, if you're new or you're still suffering alcoholic, that's the only people I really care about. The rest of you people, this is maybe entertainment, but this is what I'm, <laughs> right, I'm really talking to you, you know. I didn't do any of this on my own, you know. You know, today I am happy. I, I have, you know, so I have a job. I have stuff, I'm, and, and but mainly I have peace and I have happiness and I have lots of love and and I got a lot of great friends and I understand how to live and go through life with a lot more grace and a lot more elegance than I ever imagined. Um, you know, but none of this happened just on my own. A bunch of guys just grabbed a hold of me and said, you know, come stick with us. You know, and we worked the steps together. Ten of us went through the book and worked the steps together. It took a year and a half to listen to each other do this. And it was tremendous. Um, you know, I think you all know the basics of this program. But, you know, the really important thing I wanted to, to get across, though, is that, is that we, we, I didn't do this on my own. If you're really still suffering, reach out a hand. All these people, everybody like me, man, I'm dying for you to reach your hand out to me. I want to help. You know, I want to be useful. I want to be able to take what's happened to me and have it make a difference to somebody else's life. And I think 98% of my friends feel exactly the same way. That's how, and I learned it from them. <laughs> I didn't make it up myself. I learned it from all these other people. You know, so reach out, you know, get a gang um, and, and, and do this thing together. Um, so, I, you know, I don't really know what there's there's not much I can think of to say. You know, I can tell you about, you know, we're going to step or something profound or, you know, pray. I think you all know all that, you know. But the most important thing when I thought about what I would talk about today is, you know, don't try and do it alone. It can't be done alone. And that by me relying on other guys and relying on my higher power, and I mean relying on my higher power and other people, not just guys, but there's plenty of women who have helped out too. I mean, you know, uh, plenty. But this is something that we do together. And, um, you know, so I hope that you reach out and you find people to do this together with. All right. Cheers. I'm really nervous here. Um, <laughs> this is my only second, my, my only, only my second time speaking. So um, forgive me if I am just going to try to do this right. Okay. First of all, my name is Kirsten and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Kirsten. Um, my home group is Four Horsemen. It's held every Wednesday at 7.30 to 8.30 in Fremont Baptist Church. And um, I have a sponsor, Victoria B., who also has a sponsor, who has a sponsor. My sobriety date is um, July 6th, 2013. So what it was like. Um, 
and try and keep this part short because the last time I only gave myself like two minutes to get sober. So, um, so I was always an escapist. I really loved books. I didn't really want to be in reality ever. Um, and I, I'll just skip ahead to like my first drink. I was 14. Um, I was with a friend and we went up the street and this kid uh, who had designs on her really wanted to uh, get us drunk so he could make out with her and whatever. So we had some cherry brandy and then we snuck back into my house and um, I continued to drink with her and mainly I didn't really like it. I did it to relax and be social and so that I could get away with doing stupid things that I wanted to do anyway, but really couldn't justify doing um, while sober. Um, let's see. Uh, when I was 15, I kind of got into pot and I mostly left drinking behind for quite a while. Um, started doing psychedelics when I was 16 and then I didn't really drink that much. Um, I mean, I would drink at parties in high school and I would usually throw up. Um, and then when I was 23, I decided that I wanted my life to be a little bit bigger than my living room, my couch, my TV, and my bong. So I wanted to, um, I started drinking with people at work and, uh, shortly thereafter I moved to Austin, Texas, and, um, I got a whole new social life and that included drinking. And I really think that my drinking was pretty normal, um, it was more like, uh, it wasn't like one of those like bad out of hell alcoholics. I was like the frog in the, in the water, like just turn up the heat slowly. And that's kind of how it happened until then it really happened until the water started boiling. But, um, so, um, I got a job as a bartender when I was about, I guess I was 25 and I drank every time I was at work. I got drunk when I was at work cause that's what everyone else did. And how else do you deal with drunks, but get drunk. Um, so, um, and then when I was 29, I joined roller derby and I started drinking even more. Um, it was part of the culture. It was a lot of fun. That's what all my friends were doing. Um, and again, I wanted to be, uh, accepted. I wanted to be cool. I wanted to, um, be able to be in social environments without feeling just completely at a loss. Um, and I, th I don't think that things really started to get out of hand. I wasn't really drinking. I, I don't know. I was binge drinking a lot. Um, but at a certain point I started drinking because I felt like it was a solution as opposed to a tool. And, um, then when I, I broke up with my boyfriend in like early 2005 and it was devastating to me. And I just started partying. I started going out at full throttle. Um, I was back in school at this point. I was freaking out because, um, my perfectionism had just like totally gotten a hold of me. And, um, I thought, I, I'd lost sight of who I was. I had no idea. And I thought that the answer was to look for it in the way that other, that I saw other people found their happiness or that's what I thought. And, um, so, um, I was going to school. I was using my loans to pay my bar tabs and buy Coke. And I was just completely lost. And I graduated from school just barely, um, with really poor grades. Like there were semesters where I barely passed and I only got like one, like three credits cause I just couldn't. And that was like my second go round. And I had promised that I would really do well that time. Um, um, I quit doing Coke in like 2007 and I went to this, like, it's like a therapy boot camp kind of thing. And you know, some of these people had the nerve to suggest that maybe if I cut down on my drinking, that my life would be better. And I was just like, 
you Bible beating jerks. Like, I don't know who you think you are, but that is not my problem. This is like, it's this, it's life. It's, you know, the guys that I'm cho- or that I'm going out with, like my friends were always like, well, you can't find like decent guys because your picker is broken. And I really believe that. I really did. Um, and so what happened was um, I left Austin when I graduated school. I was going to make my way in the world. I was going to, um, I was really going to go somewhere. My career, I was never going to wait tables again. <laughs> and uh, I traveled to Santa Fe. I traveled to Chicago. Um, I traveled to Ashland, Oregon, and I worked at a bunch of different theaters with varying results. Um, but there was always something really like it would be either a personal situation or a professional situation that would just be so messed up that I would just have to drink. And, you know, after I left Austin, I didn't have any friends anymore. And so I would end up just like all I had was like my dog and my cat and booze. And, um, I left Ashland in disgrace, pretty much. Um, I had gotten tendonitis really bad, and I didn't, even though the doctor told me that, you know, inflammation is oftentimes caused by drinking, I didn't stop drinking. Um, I uh, So I moved to Seattle, and I lost a job. I didn't attribute that to drinking, because that wasn't what it was. Um, and... Uh, Basically, I was dating somebody, and we were going to go on a camping trip. And I decided that I needed um, a box of wine for an overnight camping trip, even though I already had, like, this bottle of rum. And I was we, – we hiked in, and we got in a fight, and I was drunk, and the fight escalated, and he made me go back to the car so he could drive me home. And while we were sitting in the car, I was just, like – I was drunk, and – there was no one sitting in the back seat, but I heard this voice that said, Kirsten, you drink too much. And I was just like, oh, um, okay, yeah, I think I drink too much. And he was, I won't take his inventory, but he could, he, he qualifies to be here. <laughs> he was just like, whatever, girl. And so uh, the next day I was very upset, and my neighbor took me to a meeting. And um, she told me that she had been very concerned, and she made me promise to go to six meetings in six weeks. And, uh, the first meeting I went to, I was, I didn't think I should be there, but then the speaker said, one of the people that shared said something that really like hit home with me. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I could go to another meeting. Um, and, um, then the next meeting I went to, uh, the Ballard basket and this woman approached, I cried through the entire thing. I was really angry that everyone seemed so happy. And they were laughing. (laughs) And I thought that like when, when I quit drinking, that everything would just kind of magically get better if that was really my problem. But I felt like someone had peeled my skin off. Um, and this woman came up to me and she was like, here's my number. I want you to call me every day. And I was like, no, you're like this bossy old lady. You need to leave me alone. (laughs) Um, so, but I kept going to meetings because I had promised and because I didn't know what else to do. I was really, really overwhelmed and freaked out. And I just didn't know what to do with myself. I spent a lot of time just at my house by myself. Um, so I finally got a sponsor and, um, that didn't really work out. I, she was the sponsor of the kind that I wanted where I could only call her like two days out of the week, um, because she was out of town the rest of the time. And that sounded perfect, but then it ended up not being perfect when I needed to get in touch with somebody. And, um, so, and I was still, I work in the restaurant industry and I was going to wine tastings and I was actually tasting the wine. And, you know, there was like the bar manager there, um, where I worked was an alcoholic and he would taste things and spit them out. So I thought, well, that was fine. I could also do that. Um, but that ended up in a couple of relapses. Um, and I got fired from that job. And, um, it was shortly after that, that I got a new sponsor. Oh no, I guess I got her like right before. And she was a kind of a drill instructor. (laughs) She was, she was like, you got to call me every day. And she wanted me to do things like be on time when I met, you know, when she (laughs) agreed to meet me and that made me really mad for a long time. But, um, you know, uh, 
I think that like I started working the steps with her and um I guess the first step was like really and truly accepting that I was an alcoholic, which was really hard for me. Um I um I guess I don't know if I I don't have time to go through all the steps, but okay. So I guess what I'd like to say now is that I am not the poster child for AA and all the things that it can bring you. I oftentimes pull the half measures thing. And because of that, and because I have actually worked the program effectively, I feel at points in my life, I can tell a real difference between when I'm actually working the steps and working my program and when I'm not. And, um, I'm sorry, I get so emotional. Um, so recently, like I was up to step nine and I have been on it for a long time. I've made some pretty substantial amends. I think some like really big ones. I've tackled the big ones and, um, including, uh, because of this program, I was able to go home and help my mom out when she, um, broke her leg this earlier this year. And, um, I never would have been able to do that without this program. Um, I was really, really resentful towards her, um, because of the way things went when I was a kid. And it's only been recently and through this program that I've been able to see my part in our relationship and to forgive her and really, and truly, espouse the, or just absorb the knowledge that, you know, my parents did the best they could. They couldn't give what they didn't have. And, um, so I've gone back to six and seven and that's kind of where I am now is working with character defects. And before I just kind of thought that I was a piece of crap because, I wasn't blonde. I wasn't taller. I didn't, wasn't cool enough. And now I know I'm not a piece of crap, but, um, you know, it's this opportunity to improve my character. That's really, um, made this growth. It's like a growth opportunity. Um, and I think that I would never have even, considered anything like that. I mean, I read a ton of self-help books. I was just like, yeah, I've read them. Why am I not better? Why isn't my life perfect? Like I've read enough books to, um, you know, to fill a library. Um, but it was really through this program that I've been able to make some strides. I've gotten, you know, despite some half measures when I'm working the program, my life is so much easier. And when they say that, like, We'll be, we'll be able to instinctively um, know what to do in situations which used to baffle us. That in itself for me is such a gift. Like, I don't know everything, but sometimes I know. And because sometimes I know when I never used to know, that is, that to me is like hope. It's like real hope. It's based on something real. And I know that um, there is a solution um, if you're new here, please keep coming back. Um, I don't know if this talk has <laughs> inspired anyone, <laughs> but, uh, but you can, you can find hope in these rooms and, um, this program works if you work it. Um, but you gotta work it. It's like going to the gym. You can't just sit on the, uh, on the bicycle and read magazines. So, um, thank you. Hi, my name is Alex, and I'm an alcoholic. Yes. Um, I'm really nervous because I care about what you think of me, um, <laughs> even though I don't know you. <laughs> I was trying to explain that earlier. Anyways, um, so I'll just get started. I grew up in an um, alcoholic home. My father drank a lot. My mom suffers from the ism, but she doesn't have the physical allergy. Um, my home was really, really chaotic, but there was a lot of love in my home. Um, so, so much love. Um, my first drink was when I was 12. Oh, let me back up. My birthday is, uh, May 22nd. 
this time around, I haven't really focused a lot on like what my birthday is or what the anniversaries are because um, I realized that this disease is going to kill me and I have to do it one day at a time. Um, so May 22nd, 2014 is my birthday. I have a sponsor and I have a home group more than one. Anyways. Um, <laughs> so I, um, my first drink was when I was 12. Um, it was Christmas time. I have a really big German family and, um, I was, I started off with like a sip of these peppermint schnapps. They're disgusting. Mm -hmm. And I remember that just like, just the memory of it. It was just, I was repulsed. And then I got that feeling, that euphoria, you know, it was just like this wave hit me of just like, whoa, there's a whole nother way to do this. I got this. (laughs) Like I have arrived and I'm only 12. (laughs) And, um, and then I proceeded after that, like I couldn't stop. I was like going around the party, like taking sips of like other people's, you know, glasses and drinks. And then I blacked out. And then I came to, and I was sitting at the dinner table. I don't know how I got there. And we were all saying grace. And then I projectile vomited all over my dinner plate (laughs) in front of everybody while they were all praying. (laughs) And what's really funny about that is like my family is like actually like really like really like staunch atheists. And I was like, why is everyone praying? (laughs) Like, (laughs) Like what are we, what kind of show are we putting on for each other? Like, what is this? So, um, And then I went around the entire house that night, vomiting all over the place, all over myself, crying, just, uh, and that is exactly how every single one of my drinks after that was, unless I was trying to control it. And, um, I could never control and enjoy my drinking ever. It was one or the other. I was either going completely buck wild or I was like monitoring like, okay, I think it's been two minutes. I'll take a sip. Okay. Okay put it down and eyeing everybody's drink. I was miserable. Um, I was not, I didn't drink for many, um, many years in high school. I was dry. I had discovered, um, cross country running. Um, I got a scholarship to go to college and I did that through, um, getting this scholarship. And I went to, as soon as I went to college, it was like on, It was just on. I realized that like I could eat whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted to, I could drink whenever I wanted, whenever I wanted to. Um, I could go to parties. I could stay up late. I could do, I just screw school, you know? And that's what I did. And I did that for a really, really long time until, um, and then like it started, I noticed for me, other people had noticed and had always mentioned like, that's a, you've had a few drinks. And even then I'd be like, uh, that's, I, this is nothing really. I'm, t- I'm actually toned back, <laughs> dialing this down. And then, um, I think I had like tried to monitor, or, like alter my drinking around like age 20 or so. And I was like, oh, I'll pick up yoga. I'll get, you know, spiritual and, um, didn't work out. I kept drinking. I couldn't, once I started, I, I realized, I don't know what age I was, but I realized I couldn't stop once I started. And it didn't matter what I drank. I couldn't, the allergy was in me. It was like, I just couldn't stop. I was so powerless and it didn't frighten me. (laughs) Like I was like, Hmm. Okay. And, um, I guess after that, like, um, I had, I had done the thing where I really tried to stop and start and, you know, whiskey to beer or whatever. Um, I didn't like beer so much cause I was, um, worried about getting fat and, um, super vain, and, um, one day my dad died, um, he had, he had been diagnosed with cancer and he was, uh, he and I were very, very close. He was a big part of my story. And, um, his, the anniversary of his death was actually last month. Um, I don't know what happened, but something in me, like the fatality of life and like this person that I had held so dear was like ripped out of the world, like so quickly for me. And I was just so pissed and, um, I went across the world. I went to Bali, Indonesia to try and like deal with this. And I thought like, okay, I'll stop drinking. Like I'm all right. And I couldn't, I was all the way across the world trying to cope with, um, the lot, this loss and like trying to quit drinking. And I, and I couldn't like, I, it was so bizarre to me that like I wake up in the morning in paradise, you know, just beautiful beaches and temples everywhere and just fresh food and markets. And the people were amazing. And then, and I couldn't stop drinking. Like I had, I had had all these outside things and all these outside things were supposed to make me happy and they weren't. 
and I got back to America, and I was driving home drunk one day, which I did frequently, and I had a three-month-long blackout. Like, there's three months where I don't remember any, like, I, I remember, like, I got dental work, and that's it. <laughs> like, I was at my mom's house some, but all that is, like, gone. Um, that's how long the blackout lasted. And I was driving home drunk, and I hit an ambulance with someone inside of it, and they were trying to get help, and I almost killed them. And that's what it took for me to get sober. Um, actually, it didn't. I went around the corner and got drunk. And then a couple of days later, I was standing around in my room. And um, I was thinking, like, okay, if I had a million dollars, I would go to treatment and get a personal trainer. Like, the vanity, right? <laughs> and in that moment, I heard all of this glass break. And I was like, what is that? I turned and looked around, and this Buddha that my father had given me had fallen off the windowsill and had broken every single one of my wine glasses, and I got sober. After that, I was like, oh, maybe maybe this is a sign. And so <laughs> um, my journey in recovery has not been a linear experience. Um, I used to think very, like, black and white, and I used to think that it had to be this linear thing, that, like, if I did one thing once, I would never do it again, and I'd learn from it, and I'd just get, like, up on this mountaintop, and that's just, like, not um, recovery for me. Um, for me, it's, like, this very, like, cyclical thing, and, like, I go through phases, and different things get brought up along the way. Um, the one constant that has been there is this relationship with a higher power. I choose to call it God. Uh, it's easier. You guys get it. You know what I mean? What I'm thinking of God may not necessarily be what you guys are thinking of God. It's just a very easy way for me to say it. Or I could say HP, but I just say God. Um, so when I came into the rooms, I really, really, I was so repulsed by the word God that I actually went through my big book with my sponsor, um, as outlined. And every time that word was in the book, I took a black, uh, permanent marker and I crossed it off and I wrote in what I wanted to call my higher power. And, um, I couldn't even do that at first. I was like, so angry at God. I was so angry at God, this God that like, you know, years of abuse that I endured as a young girl. And then, um, taking away the one thing that I loved and held so dear, you know, and I was just furious. And then I, one day my sponsor told me that that had nothing to do with God and that that was man's will. And, um, I don't know. It just something in me clicked. It was just like, wait, all of those years I spent blaming God for all this stuff. It had nothing to do with God. It had everything to do with my, with me and my relationships with people. Oh, like, well, I've been doing it wrong. And, um, <laughs> and there was a lot of freedom for me in that, that I could choose whatever I wanted, um, to make my higher power. And you know what? My higher power also hasn't been the same thing. I've really had to reevaluate, um, my relationship with my higher power and what I view my higher power as. Cause sometimes I still go back to this whole dogmatic idea that, um, God is, you know, punishing me. I'm a bad girl. Like I've done something wrong. You know, I didn't, I littered, you know, so now I'm gonna, you know, and get all this karma and I'm going to be punished. So, um, I go back and forth and like, I have to do these like spot check inventories with myself and God where I'm like, Oh, okay. Like that, that's an old idea. That's like something my parents told me, or that's something I heard growing up. Like that isn't what I choose to, um, worship. And that isn't what I choose to believe in. So, um, backing up a little bit, I actually, um, I was sober for almost three years. Um, Memorial Day weekend, I decided one day at work, like the allergy had been ignited. I'd moved across the country to Texas. I moved a lot, a lot of, I'm a geographic alcoholic. I like to think that if I go somewhere else, I'm going to be cured. Um, it's not true. Um, I'm not actually exactly who I am all the time, no matter where I go. And I'll get that temporary high. It's the same thing, right? It's the same thing as drinking. I get that temporary high, that temporary effects. I'm like, oh, I'm in Mexico. This is amazing. I'm a different person. I've arrived. And then all of a sudden, like, I'm restless, irritable, and discontent. I'm still me. So um, <laughs> I went to Texas, and I decided to live there. And I was working for this really big, like, catering company and, like, cooking for celebrities and just, you know, kind of engaging in this um, really bad behavior for me or un not bad, but unhealthy behavior around work. Where I was working like 20 hour shifts and sleeping like two or three hours a night and then getting up and working another 20 hour shift. You know, I wanted, I was trying to get those, that financial insecurity 
uh, filled through outside sources. But when really, you know, like it says in the book and what I've come to realize today is that God is my employer. Really, truly, I have to do that all the time. I'm like, okay, if I mess up at work, I'm like, that's right, God, you're my employer. All right. And like, sometimes I'll actually physically like put my hands up because I, I need that for myself. Um, so, um, I don't know. One day, um, I had stopped going to meetings when I was in Texas. I was cured. I had a boyfriend. I had everything I needed, right? I had this job. I was on top of the world and I went out. It was so easy. It was so easy. And I was out for exactly a year, which is really strange. Um, <laughs> cause I, uh, my, my rock bottom this last time wasn't as, um, intense. There was no like glass breaking and like voice from the sky. Um, I had woken up at a coworker's house and I had clothes on and the last memory I had, I did not. So I was like, Oh God, here it is again. That, that waking up, like, you know, the four horsemen, you're just like, Oh my God, like, where am I? How did I get here? What did I do? And in that moment, I just knew I was like, I have to go back. I have to go back to AA. Before I did that, I took many shots of tequila and uh, <laughs> went to work. <laughs> and I was like, this will do. But um, yeah, I got a sponsor right away and I immediately started working the steps. And this time I experienced there was no pink cloud. Um, I was not feeling it. And I worked the steps like I was dying because I had realized like how easy it was for me to go out. It's just so easy and effortless. And, um, so this time around has been a completely different experience. You know, I've worked, um, the steps in a couple of different programs since I've been here. Um, I think the 12 steps can be applied to like any area of my life. Um, I'm of service today. Um, I guess I'll talk about like a regular day for me. Um, a regular day for me is I wake up and I immediately pray. Sometimes I pray in bed. Sometimes I get on my knees. I feel like God understands, you know, my human mind likes to tell me I'm being a bad person because I'm not getting on my knees every single morning and every single night. And that's something like that, that I continually have to work on is not using AA as a whipping tool. And, um, so sometimes I pray in bed and sometimes I pray on my knees. I chant in the morning and I run as a form of meditation. Um, that's when I get to talk to God, all my complaints, you know what I mean? I've been storing them up all day, you know, writing them out and then sending them to my sponsor each night sometimes isn't enough, you know? So I like to get a, you know, my word in, <laughs> but I feel like my higher power can handle that. My God understands that my God made me this way on purpose. And, um, I want to have a relationship with my God that feels authentic to me. Cause I spent my entire life pretending I was something that I wasn't because I thought you would like me better. The reality is, is I have no control over you. And the only thing I can manage is like, just trying to enhance my relationship with God, start there and then go to meetings and be of service. Um, I have a lot of people that I check in with. I read daily readers when I get back from my, um, run. I read daily readers. I go into work. I read 84 through 86. Um, and I'm also reading like the history of AA right now or AA comes of age. Um, I read that in between breaks. My sponsor has been working on a lot of projects. Um, and then throughout the day, I'm usually staying in contact with someone in AA, more than one person, usually many. And um, I have a sponsee. I actually just got done working with her um, right before I came here. And I feel like kind of stunned. It's like AA overload. <laughs> but it feels really good. It's, it's wonderful. There's no other way I would, I would have it at this point. Um, yeah, that's – and then at the end of the night, I do an inventory – and then I take pictures of it and I email it to my sponsor. Um, that way, like my garbage doesn't sit with me because, um, that was an easy way I went out last time. Um, that's my time and that's what I do. Thank you. My name is Jeff. I am an alcoholic. Yeah. My sobriety date is two fourteen twenty twelve. 2012. Uh, I am, my home group is the Four Horsemen group, which meets Wednesdays at 7 at Fremont Baptist Church. I am also a regular attendee of Queen Anne Study on Sundays. Uh, I invite you to come out to those. Um, I have a sponsor and I have sponsees. And uh, this is not my first time uh, doing the program. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, they say it takes what it takes, and I don't know why that is. It just is the way that it is. Um, I turned 49 about two weeks ago, 
And uh, one of the things that I hear a lot from people my age in rooms is uh, statements like, I wish I'd got this sooner, or in my case, I wish I'd kept it when I did have it. And uh, I thought about that a lot when I got sober this time. Um, I had seven years. I was out for a year, and then I had five years. And, um, and then I, I didn't actually go out so much as I just stopped going to AA, and there's a reason for that. But um, So when I got sober this time, I asked myself what was going to be different, and I've looked really long and hard at, at uh, the path that I've taken to where I'm at today. Um, I guess my uh, first step really begins in 2005 uh, on my 39th birthday. I was on my way home from work. Uh, I had, in my mind at least, I was sober and I had arrived. Uh, I managed a print shop. I made good money. Uh, I'd been married about 10 years, uh, had a four-year-old daughter. And uh, really, I, I was incredibly unhappy. And I'm not really certain why, um, but it's kind of unimportant. <laughs> um on the way home, I was in an accident. Uh, I rode a motorcycle at the time. Had it been in a car, it would have been a fender bender, but that's not the way it worked out. As a result of that accident, I lost my left foot. Um, this is obviously a momentous event in my life. And um, I didn't drink over it at the time, and I'm not, I don't know why. I don't know why that is, and it's something I thought about a lot. I don't really have an answer for that. But um, the next, like, three years would have a lot of impact in my world. Uh, about two years after that, my marriage fell apart, mostly as a result of my accident, and uh, I left. And then uh, six months after that, in March of 2009, I lost my job, like a lot of people did in the market crash. Even at that point, I still didn't drink. Um, I went into an extremely deep, deep, deep depression. And uh, I didn't work for almost two years after that. And uh, it was a really rough time. And I was doing largely what I thought I could in order to maintain my life. I was seeing a psychiatrist at the time. Uh, I was seeing a counselor at the time. I was trying to keep my life together. What I wasn't doing is I wasn't coming here. I wasn't going to AA. Um, the reason for that at the time was that um, as of my accident, I thought, you know what? If this is what God has in store for me, if this is what my sobriety life has in store for me, not interested, done with it. I'll just not drink and not come. And uh, <laughs> so about this time, something started creeping into my thought that, um, that I wasn't really truly an alcoholic. Uh, and I started, I didn't realize that I had done this. In the past, when I had been in AA, I had been very, very involved. I'd been, uh, I had home groups, I had service positions, I had sponsees, some of whom are still sober today. And I would go through, and there's, you know, there's four chapters, if you include the doctor's opinion, where it talks about what it is to be an alcoholic. And I would read through these with guys, and I, and I would look at it, and I would go, well, you know, I never did that, and I never did that, I did that, and I never did that, but I did that and that and that. And so, and I didn't realize, I didn't think this consciously, but I was like, you know, I'm only three-eighths of an alcoholic. <laughs> um, I didn't realize that that was actually at the core of what, uh, of what was happening. It says in the big book that we must concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. And that's what it says the first step is. And uh, I was unable to do that. Um, so I was out uh, in um, 2010, October of 2010. I was out playing music with some friends. And uh, I was uh, having some dinner before the show. And I thought, you know what? A whiskey and Coke would go great with this burger. And uh, that went so well. I repeated the experiment the following week. And uh, so the second week, it was about three drinks, you know, and that one went so well, I decided to try the home version. And I bought some whiskey on the way home. And uh, it was literally, it was about three weeks before I was by myself in my basement until three in the morning, every single night, drinking a pint to a fifth. And I, you know, I was pounding my fist on my desk because I wasn't at the bar thinking, you know, how did this happen? Oh, well, I might as well do this now. Um, that year, I drank for an entire year. Uh, I was going to school. I was getting decent grades, uh, 3.7. Um, I was doing all right. I was keeping it all hidden. Nobody really knew. Um, I don't have a whole lot of direct repercussion for my drinking. I don't, I've never blacked out. I'm not violent. I'm not a Jekyll and Hyde. Hence the, I didn't do this, that, and the other thing. Never switch. It's always whiskey. Um, but I was alone, and I was lonely, and I was miserable, and I got to the point where I didn't even want to be around the people that I care about, and I certainly didn't want them to know about what I was doing. Um, 
when the holidays of 2011 came around, I was on break from school and I was largely at home alone. My girlfriend at the time uh, is a Dickens caroler. So she was gone morning till late at night, every single day through December. And I, I was left to my own devices and I started drinking really heavily because I didn't have anything else to do. And um, at the end of the holidays, I decided this is really bad. I need to get myself in control. And I decided that I was going to do whatever it took to not drink. And I initially started by trying to not drink on my own. And that kind of failed miserably. And when things got really desperate and I had to do something terribly, terribly desperate, I decided, you know what? I'm going to do the answer. I'm going to go to AA. So I went every day. There's a meeting that meets uh, about two blocks away from where I lived at the time. Uh, they meet twice every single day. And uh, so I decided to go to the 5 o'clock meeting. And I couldn't make it. I could not get to 5 o'clock without drinking. I thought, okay, this is fine. I got this one handled. <clears throat> I'll just go to the noon meeting. I couldn't make it till noon. So uh, it talks about in the big book about needing, uh, some of us need to get physically removed from our addiction. And uh, it turns out that that's actually what I needed to do. And um, so I uh, made arrangements to go into treatment. I went to Highline Addiction Recovery. And um, here's where it gets sort of, uh, well, for me, interesting. Uh, <laughs> I had no money and I had no insurance, and my girlfriend at the time was willing to pay to send me to treatment. So I made arrangements, I got all the numbers sussed out, it was $5,000 to go to treatment. And so I got on the bus on a Saturday, uh, when I got ready to leave, she said, go get well, hurry back. I got down there and they said, no, you drink way too much, we're going to have to send you through detox. And so I had to call her up from the admission place and say, you know what, it's not going to be 5000 it's actually going to be 10000 Right. <laughs> and uh, and she agreed. I was not privy to this conversation, but she agreed. So um, so I went into detox on the 10th of February on uh, Valentine's Day. I want you to sit with me on this one. <laughs> on Valentine's Day, which was my last day in detox, I called my girlfriend up and said, I love you, honey. Happy Valentine's Day. <clears throat> and she was quiet. And I said, are you going to say anything? And she said, I don't ever want to talk to you again. Do not call me. I will not answer. Do not leave a message. I will not listen. Do not write me. I will not read it. I'm going to sell everything that you own in order to help pay for some of the cost of what you have cost me in order to send you to treatment. And uh, so uh, I'm in treatment now and um, I'm starting to, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I'm starting to wade through some of my first step. And four chapters they talk about all this stuff about how people drink and what it is to be an alcoholic and all this kind of stuff. And it all gets boiled down, not there, but in this paragraph that they inserted, you know, which I never read before, but they inserted into the We Agnostics. At the very beginning, it says, if when you really want to stop, you cannot stop or once having started, cannot control the amount you drink. And I thought, holy crap, excuse me, for the first time, that's me. I really get it. I could not stop on my own. Um... The next thing was that I couldn't do it on my own, and I couldn't do it here in the rooms with you people. I couldn't just sit down, go to meetings, and not drink in between. I needed help from a higher power. And in my mind, I thought that step two was all about you know what God is and where God can be found and what God means and all that kind of stuff. Once again, there's a little sentence in We Agnostics that totally boils down step two, at least for me. It says, do I now believe or am I willing to believe? that there is a power greater than myself. Being in treatment, I had to know that there was a power greater than myself, right? So I'm done one and two now. And I'm in the middle of three, and I didn't know it at the time. I called all my friends. I said, yeah, my girlfriend's selling all my stuff. Just so you get a picture of this, we're talking four guitars, three basses, three amps, three keyboards, two drum sets, 2,500 CDs, 300 books, most of which were first editions, signed, and uh, I wanted that stuff so bad, I had to get it back. And I'm like, I'm calling my friends up, and I'm saying, can you talk to her? Can you get this? Can you make sure she doesn't sell that? Make sure she gets this much for that item. <laughs> and I was talking to my counselor, and uh, he said to me, he said, what's really important to you right now? He said, I, I know that this stuff's important to you, but what, what's the primary thing that you're dealing with right now? And I said, you know, the truth is, I really just don't want to want to drink anymore. And he said, so 
getting your stuff back, if you leave here or you spend all your energy doing that, is that really going to help facilitate your sobriety? And I sat with that for a couple of days and I realized, I thought, what happens if I really don't have any of that stuff when I come out of here? And I thought, you know what, this is more important and this is better. I will take sobriety. I will take the loss of the lack, you know, the desire to drink. I just wanted to be rid of that so bad. So um, I get to the end. I'm, I, it's, it's a Wednesday. On Thursday, I'm getting ready to leave. And I'm talking to my counselor again. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I got no place to go. I got no job. I got no money. And he said, okay, well, what are you going to do? I don't know. He said, no, really, literally, you're going to leave here tomorrow with your bag of stuff and that's it. What are you going to do? And I went, oh, uh, I guess I'll go to a meeting, find some food and find a place to stay. He said, that's a great idea. Why don't you try doing that the next day too? And that's literally what I did. That's how I walked out of treatment. <clears throat> um, I called my mom up and asked to stay at her place, which she graciously agreed to. She lives in elderly housing, so it was a little um, um, <laughs> studio apartment with an alcove, and she let me sleep on her uh, floor. Um, I got in touch with Oxford House, and uh, I borrowed $200 from my brother for the uh, non-refundable deposit, which was pretty amazing, considering the fact that I hadn't talked to him in probably two years. And he just said, yeah, no problem. Uh, I went to Oxford. I said, I want to live here. They said, that's great. Um, you have to pay uh, this month's rent and next month's rent by the end of the month, or we're going to ask you to leave. And, um, so I went out and I, I found some work. Uh, I got a job through labor works working in a glass recycling place. Um, I spent, uh, 12 hours a day, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday wading through 15 foot mounds of glass cleaning up and, you know, covered in head to foot. I got a respirator and goggles and I'm told because there's glass dust everywhere. And, uh, you know, I'd be pulling rubbers and needles and napkins out of this knee deep in glass. I'm just thinking, I can't do this. This is, this is horrible. This is the, this is where alcoholics go when they die. <laughs> you know, pulling, oh, there's a needle. Oh, there's a rubber. Oh, look, a crown royal cap, you know? So, <clears throat> I would go in on a Friday morning and I would say, you know what, I can't do this. I physically can't do it. My legs screwed up. I'm, I'm on my feet all day. It's rough work. I cannot do this, but I need the money, so I'll make it to break. So I would make it to break and I'd, I'd get a, a respite and I'd go, okay, you know what, I can make it to lunch. That's fine. So I would make it to lunch and then I'd be like, well, you know, I can make it to the end of the day, but that's it. I'm not coming back on Saturday. Skip that. That's, that's toast, you know. And then the day would get done, and I would go home, and I'd think, you know what, if I leave, if I don't come back the next day, they can't get anybody because labor works is closed. There's only two other guys on the floor. So not only am I starting to realize what's important for me, I'm starting to get out of myself, too. And so I would go back in, and I did the same thing again. I did that for two months, quitting every single day. <laughs> My life is really not much different today. It's better. I like my job more. And I have all of you people. And that's a wonderful thing. But I still live it in that moment by moment, kind of this is what I need to be doing right now. This is what's really important to me right now. This is what I need to do until the next thing comes along and makes itself evident. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I don't know why it takes what it takes, but uh, I wouldn't wish for a different past. Because everything that's happened has made me who I am and has brought me to where I am today. And there's no place I would rather be. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.